Um, welcome, everybody. Sorry about the small delay. We had a technical issue in terms of both of my laptops going dark last night. So uh, we'll have to make do with the equipment we have. And you'll have to listen to me more than uh, watch the screen, unfortunately. Um, I don't know how many of you were attending yesterday's Skripal. OK, so most of you. Um, I promise that we'll cover some of the tools and methods that we used in identifying the script ball suspects, but also go over some of the tools that we've used across the different investigations we did. Um, one of my secret goals is to convey to you that no, we don't get leaks from secret services. Yesterday, after the presentation, uh, there was a press conference by the Russian Foreign Ministry, where Maria Zaharova, the spokesperson for the Foreign Ministry, explicitly stated that the latest investigation by Bellingcat and the BBC, which was in identifying the movements of the third group of suspects in London, was based on a leak from the British Secret Services, um, because only they could, could, could have received this data through legal means. Uh, that was an interesting statement, because if the British services had received that data from, through legal means, then the Russian government would know about it, because they would have authorized it. Um, I wonder if they know about it. And in that case, maybe they have given it to the British authorities. But we received it completely independently from a whistleblower working for the Russian mobile operator that, uh, to which that number was, uh, was connected. Uh, how many of you have read that story about the third, whether on the BBC? OK, so about 50-50. I'll just give a very short summary, because part of the examples I want to go through connect to that, uh, to that story. Um, so, oh, you have it? Yeah, Let, let's have a quick look at it. Okay, that was a short version of it, but apparently yesterday, that's how many times she mentioned Bellingcat in the, in the explanation. Um, what she's talking about was the latest report, uh, which we did, and it was ready a, a few months ago but we delayed publishing it because the whistleblower who had provided the telephone data was still in Russia. And we waited for that whistleblower to leave Russia, which was the plan. And he, he or she shared that with us ahead of time. And that's why we felt comfortable that we can use it after they're out of Russia. So what we were able to obtain was, um, mm. based on the, telephone, on the passport number sequencing that, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, seem to indicate that members of the senior GRU foreign operations teams are issued passport numbers in a batch. Um, and it, it's not one batch that goes forever. Every couple of years, obviously, passports uh, in, in Russia, passports have an expiration date of five years, uh, international passports, if I remember correctly. So every three or four years, they have a new batch. But each new batch contains more or less a, a, a sequential set of, of numbers of people that work for the GRU. So in this particular case, based on our Scripple uh, investigation into the first two suspects, we found that sequence for, that, for the current number of passports. We found a third person who was traveling to London at about the same time as the other two. We looked that person up. Um, by the time we started looking for the identity of that third person, Russia had cleansed all passport data of all GRU officers from their central database. So we couldn't find easily for that third person the the uh, identity, and we could not find a passport attached to the real identity after we identified. Uh, the fake identity was in the name uh, Sergei Fedotov, Sergei Vyacheslavovich Fedotov, with a particular birth date, uh, if I remember correctly, 17, 17 of uh, September 1973. We found out that the real identity of that person was uh, Denis Vyacheslavovich Sergeyev, with the same birthday as the fake identity. It was a departure from the standard algorithm that we discussed yesterday, because they didn't use the first and the patronymic name, and only changed the last name. They changed also the first name in this case, which was unusual. Uh, but we caught up with them. Uh, the middle name remained the same. The birth date remained the same. And obviously, without having a photograph to match to the fake identity photograph, Oh, by the way, in, in, in brackets, we were able to get a photograph of the fake identity, which we published uh, back in, um, in January. How we got that? We got it um, from another whistleblower who was able to give us a, 
a screenshot of the passport with which he was crossing the Russian border, uh, traveling to London. It was a very fuzzy photograph. Uh, it's something that uh, stays at the border as a copy when people cross, cross it. It was a screenshot of a bad copy, but we have one photograph of that person uh, under the fake identity. So we needed to match him to the real identity. It was very difficult without a, uh, uh, without a copy of his real passport, which as I said was deleted. What we had to do is resort to a ruse, which is usually unethical. In this case, it's borderline ethical, uh, because we're talking about an undercover person and a, and a spy. Um, once, we had, once we knew and believed the real identity of the person is Sergei Vyacheslav, uh, Denis Vyacheslav Sergeyev, I created a fake profile on the Russian social media, VK, and I joined a Spetsnaz alumni group, pretending to have been part of the Spetsnaz in my youth. Uh, I was accepted after three days of waiting, and this happened to be the group in which Denis Vyacheslav Sergeyev had served in the 90s. So there, I just posted a link to the story that had been published by that time, the first story we published, saying, hey, has anybody seen this? It seems to be about our guy, about our comrade, uh, Denis Sergeyev. And I got immediately several DMs saying, oh, yes, they've... I didn't know he was a spy now, and, uh, and uh, do you have his contacts, and so on and so forth. I helpfully gave them his contacts. Um, <laughs> In one, one of them, and this is a true story, one, I, I can show you the email correspondence or the direct message correspondence. One of them shared a lot of information with me, with me, um, and then halfway through the conversation, he realized that I may not be who I present myself to. So he said, I have a feeling that you may not be who you say you are. And I said, why do you think so? And he says, well, because you're asking too many questions. Um, I said, well, I can tell you one thing. Um, I'm afraid you're asking too many questions. And knowing where my colleague and I work at the moment, this may endanger his mission. Um, here's the number. You can call him if you want. You can refer to me if you want. But bear in mind that you have to be very, very uh, um, limited in the words that you use on the phone. And he thought I was a colleague from Nigeria. He said, I, I understand, I will not call him, thank you very much. So I got out of that. But basically, through this ruse, I was able to get confirmation from people who work with the real person, Denis Sergeyev, that is the same person that they saw in the photograph. OK, so what we found out later was that he's a senior person to the other two. He had traveled at the same time. But we had no idea for several months what he had done in London. So we had to find out what he had done in London. Uh, the only way we could do that um, is by tracing his movements when he arrived to London. And it took us several months to get the phone data, the phone records uh, for his phone from a Russian mobile operator. Mind you, this is a phone number registered to the fake identity, right? Not to the real identity. Um, and it's a number that we assumed he would be carrying around when he travels abroad on GRU missions. So we had a hope that we would be able to get some interesting information from that. Uh, we received the data for the last three years. And that data contained the numbers he called, the numbers he received phone calls from and text messages, but also the cell tower data when he connected to the internet. Not when he made phone calls, but when he connected to the internet. And fortunately, in the last one and a half years, this person connected to the internet all the time. Now, when, before he traveled to London on this particular assignment last year, in, uh, on March uh, 2nd, 2014, uh, 2018, he signed up for a large data package. The day before he traveled, he signed up for uh, a one gigabyte package uh, of data in roaming, which is a lot of money. Um, so we knew he was going to, well, we, obviously, he, he knew he was going to use a lot of data while he traveled. So that gave us a lot of evidence for that particular trip. It also gave us evidence on what he did on other trips uh, about which we had very little data, in, including previous trips in 2017 and 16, where he traveled to Spain. And we thought he had an operation in Spain. Uh, we were wrong, because we found out, as I will show in a second, that he used Spain only as a transit point in order to cover his tracks. And then from there, he moved to other locations. 
so a few words about telephone and how we, we've used them over the years in forensic uh, analysis. Uh, obviously, telephones are amazing um, sources of data. Um, often in an investigation, we, we would come across a telephone number. Uh, and we would not know to whom that number belongs. And what are the ways that you, in your practice, have gone about? When you have a number, what would be the first thing you do to try to find the owner? Pipple. Sorry? Pipple. Pipple. Pipple.com would be uh, a, one of the first points of, of reference. But they, that works mostly for Western Europe, particularly well for America. Anything else? What will be the second choice of reference if you need to find out the owner of a number? Sorry? True caller. Do you know what true caller is? Yes. Okay. No? True caller is one of several uh, reverse phone lookup apps. And I'll talk about, I'll give you an example of two or three of them. And uh, the, the reason they're useful is because they're uh, open source in the way that the content of the numbers that are being shared in it depends on how many people install that app. So it's a network externality. Uh, problem for the people who don't want their phones to be shared. So basically, if I download the app Truecaller or any of the other apps, it will ask me to access my contact book. And if I say yes, basically, if you're a contact in my personal contact book, your number will become matched to the way I write your name in my contact book. And anybody who looks for your number will see the way I describe you in my contact book. Um, different apps like this have different popularity in different countries. So for Russia in particular, the three apps that have been extremely useful for us are Truecaller. By far more useful has been GetContact. GetContact is an extremely popular app in Russia and the former Soviet countries. And uh, the third one is called NumBuster, like number buster, NumBuster. Um, there's one relatively new one called Icon, uh, I like I. C-O-N, that's another one you can use. These are the ones that have a sort of a little bit of a bit bigger popularity in the Russia, Soviet Union, Turkey, um, more of the uh, non-Western countries. Um, there are other ones that are more popular in, 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 in Western Europe. Uh, True Caller is, is actually more popular in Western Europe than it is in Russia. Okay, so that would be one of the typical things we would use to look up a number. Uh, what other methods can you think of? Sorry? Let me use my glasses so I can see you better. OK. Um, well, the first thing I do is uh, I check all of these apps. And I've created a macro that goes through all of the apps. So actually, for myself, I would put it once. And it would check all of the apps for reverse uh, lookup and sharing. Um, a second thing I would do is I would go and check whether this number is attached to a Facebook page. And you can only do that on the mobile. Messenger. So you can't do it on the web browser of Facebook. You have to have a mobile messenger, uh, either on an iPhone or on, uh, on an Android. You open the messenger, not Facebook, and you type in the number. And something that very few people, people ev who even know this trick know is that you, you have to follow a formatting of the number in order for a result to come about. And the only formatting that matters is that the last four digits must be separated with a space. So if you're looking for a number uh, in the UK, 44 whatever, you start with a plus. And you can put all the digits sequentially, but the last four digits must be space, two, two digits, space, two digits. Only then it will find the number uh, for certain. Yes? This is like an intentional design for each by Facebook. Like they don't publicize this, but they leave it there for people who know. That Correct, and yes. It's a thing that they could take offline in the future, like they have them with grass, so it becomes a privacy. That is correct. For now, it works. And as of this morning, it works. Uh, this design bug or feature um, is not applicable on iPhone. On iPhone, you can put the continuous number. But on Android, you have to separate it with a. Well, basically, you could better to separate it because they might disable that. Uh. Um, another extremely useful thing that is very underrated um, to look up a number is, and here's what I would do. I would immediately add that number as a contact to my ever expanded, expanding contact book on, on my Android phone. phone. Um, and I would wait a couple of seconds and see whether it shows up under any of the Messenger apps. 
uh, because by design on the Android uh, phone at least, if that phone, the phone number is connected to WhatsApp or Signal or Viber uh, or any of the other default secret messengers or, or encrypted messengers, it will show it under the contact entry. You have to have those things downloaded. Yes, you have to have those things. So the more, the more you download these apps, the better it is because you'll be able to see Telegram presence, signal presence, and so on and so forth. So I recommend having a separate phone uh, for such forensic investigations for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that you don't want to share your contact list with the world. Um, second reason is you don't want to make the mistake that I made that I told about yesterday, calling from my phone number a jury officer and then seeing my own number in the phone register of that person when we obtain the data. So for many reasons, don't, don't do it on your own phone. Just, just have a spare one. And better use an Android uh, than an iPhone for this particular operation. So what, is, what does that help? Um, being able to see that some number shows up in, uh, in a messenger. Well, I, I'll give you an example with a big investigation we did in 2017, which lasted through the beginning of 2018. This investigation was um, into the shelling of the city of Mariupol in Ukraine. Um, the city was shelled, about 100 people died. Uh, it was shelled on the morning of the 24th of January, 2015. Uh, the investigation into that took a lot of, took a few years. Russia claimed Ukraine did it, Ukraine claimed Russia did it. Uh, the Russian government decided, the Ukrainian government decided to take that case to the European Court of Justice. And just before they took it to the Court of Justice, they turned to Bellingcat and said, we have evidence that has been developed by our own security service, SBU, that they claim they have identified five of the officers who, um, who commanded this shelling. We would like to give you the raw data to Bellingcat so we can get a second opinion, just because we cannot be 100% sure that the data we receive from our own security services is completely uh, legitimate or, or precise. So we received raw phone call data. Um, we accepted that assignment, but only on the condition that we will be allowed to publish the results, whatever they are, even if they're not in the interest of the Ukrainian government. They accepted that, that deal. So we took, it took us about four months of sleepless nights to listen to, I would say, 10,000 phone calls that had been captured during the days preceding and, and, and following the events. And um, these were phone calls made by people that had some role or engagement with, uh, with the separatist or movements, but it was not clear who they were because they used call signs and they, used, uh, they were very protective and they never spoke about the events that were happening, but used cold words. It's a very interesting investigation. I encourage you to, to read all of it. It's a, it's a long, uh, I think, 80-page investigation, but it, uh, it gives you a lot of insight into how secret military operations take place and the cold words. We needed to identify some of the commanders, and it was very difficult to do that because they used code words and, 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 and code names. And in one particular case, um, the, the rule of thumb is if you listen long enough, there will be one screw up. Yeah? One, one screw up ultimately happens. Uh, in the best of operation security uh, environment, there's always a girlfriend that calls despite being told not to call, or a mother who calls and says happy birthday, and then we have both the mother and the birthday. So it's, it, it's, it's, a, and it's a jackpot. Um, in this particular case that I want to describe, uh, one of the commanders, about whom we had absolutely no idea who he was, received a phone call three days before his uh, return to Russia. So it was clear that he was Russian, not Ukrainian, and the phone call was from a lady who said, I'll be waiting for you at the border. And then we had a number for this lady, okay? Uh, and nothing else, no name, no, no, no relationship between the two, just a number. I checked all the other, I checked reverse messengers, I checked uh, true caller and all of them, couldn't find the number. I put her number in my phone and a Viber presence showed up on that number. When, and Viber is important because it's not used in the West, but it's extremely popular in the East. So if you want to investigate Russia or, or, or Eastern Europe, have Viber installed. Um, when Viber shows you somebody's profile, they show you a photograph of that person. So I had a photograph of a pretty lady, yeah? Um, I put that, I, I took a screenshot of that photograph from my phone, 
and it's very important that you only take the actual face and not everything around it in order to simplify the work of the reverse image um, engines. So I took a, photo, a copy of that, and I put it in two, well, I put it in many re reverse image search engines, but only two gave me results. One is the Yandex result, uh, engine that I mentioned yesterday. It's at images.yandex.ru. And it's by far the best uh, reverse en engine um, that is available at the moment. It doesn't look for exact matches of the face. It looks for um, AI-driven uh, iterative approximations of the face. So it will find you people that look like you, not, not necessarily only your photos. And then it will rank them by similarity, and then you'll be able to go and find that uh, if there is a match or not. Another one, and that was the one that helped us in this particular case, was uh, at that time, it was a Russian app called findface.ru. Um, after we published that report and many Russian journalists made their investigations using that website, a company linked to the FSB in Russia acquired that, uh, that website and closed it down. But there's a new one. There's a new one called uh, findclone. Oh, findclone.ru, find and it's available. Findclone.ru, and we can test it right now. It's available, it is uh, not a free app, but the first 10 searches are for free. Uh, and then after that, it costs something like two euro a month to uh, two pounds a month to subscribe, so it's not expensive. It is up and running, yeah? Okay, uh, we will, basically the slogan is, we will help you find your doppelganger. Um, I will have to register for free to test it. Uh, should I do that? Well, basically, trust me, it works very well. You can, you can, <laughs> you, you can test it. I don't want to give them my phone number now as after, after what I told you happened yesterday. So, um, so basically, using that app, I found the social media profile for that woman. Um, and on that social media profile, she was occasionally with a guy who wore glasses, a bit of a, on the bigger side, definitely not a guy who looked like a, like a military officer, especially a high commander. I scrolled through all of this woman's timeline, and I never saw this person in a, in a military uniform. And uh, I did the same thing on his face, and it did not result in any matches. Um, then, completely coincidentally, when I found one of the other officers who was serving with him, I found this same person in a photograph in military uniform with the other officer. And then I wondered, why would I not have been able to reverse search his face on Yandex and find him if he was available on the internet? And what I found out was that Yandex, apparently under pressure from the Russian government, disabled reverse search for people in military uniform. So you can find anybody unless that person is in military uniform, in which case you just don't find them. So uh, I think this was a result of Bellingcat's investigation into the shelling, of, into the MH17 disaster, because we, we showed how stupid some of the Russian soldiers were in posting their, their photographs. So reverse search on Yandex works perfectly, except for military uniforms. Okay, and that's about it. Of course, the same trick you can apply with WhatsApp. Uh, in the case of WhatsApp, we were able, for example, to find that one of the GRU officers, uh, th this same guy who came to London as a commanding officer, during his trips to Spain had called three Sp Spanish numbers, and one of these numbers we were able to find in WhatsApp, and um, there was no name, but in the WhatsApp picture he was wearing a paramilitary uniform of an extreme right Spanish uh, paramilitary group. So you can have, make your conclusions about what the GRU is doing in Spain. Okay, so back to this amazing data set that we received with the, with the phone archives, uh, with the phone metadata for Mr. Fedotov slash Sergey. What could we do with it? It was three years in an Excel sheet which showed the time of the phone call, the number that was being called, whether it was data or whether it was a phone call. While he was in Russia, it showed also the type of messenger that he was using. Um, to make a, f a connection, whether it was WhatsApp or Instagram or something. And the reason why it's there is because there are different pricing packages for different uh, data on, on different messengers. And that's why there was a remark whether he had used 
three megabytes of data for a WhatsApp call or for internet browsing. So we could even get some of that data. But, but that was not enough. We needed to track his movements. Um, and I would like to show you a couple of examples of what we did with that. One is um, this, which is basically um, his trip where he, on the 29th of September 2017, traveled, and, and please, this should not be tweeted out because it's an investigation that we will publish tomorrow, so please wait until tomorrow. Um, but basically, it's a trip that this person took to Barcelona, and we thought he did something in Spain. What we found out is more interesting. So this here um, is the imported data into Google Maps. You can import any sort of uh, data that has uh, geolocation into Google Map, and I'll show in, in a minute how to do that in, in a different uh, browser window. But let's look at, at what we found out about his trip. So here we see the different dates on the left side um, of his whole trip. He flew on the 29th into Barcelona, but I think let's look at the next day because I think that's the one that is more interesting. And let's zoom in and see what happened. <coughs> So the previous day, let's just have a look at the previous day as well. Previous day, and let's check out the next day. He just flew into Barcelona. This is the airport. He went downtown. He slept there. Fine. So Nothing. This is from the phone mass. This is from the phone mass, yes. This is what happened on the first day. He arrived at about noon, as we can see, or at one. The second day, however, is more interesting because we see that in the morning at about 7 o'clock, he starts moving. He goes to a part of Barcelona at about 8.30. He stays there for a while, as we can see. But then, at about 8.43, we see him here. And then we see him there, and we start tracking him. And we find out that he took an 11-hour car trip. He stopped in Lyon. He had a meeting with somebody there. Lyon is the headquarters of Interpol, which at that very time was having an interesting meeting together with WADA, the anti-doping agency, about the punishment of Russian, uh, of Russian sportsmen and women, and about the criminal action that was planned uh, on the hacking of the WADA servers in two years earlier, or one and a half years earlier. So this is the Lyon stayover. He stays here for about two hours. Then he continues. And late in the evening, he arrives here. Yes, please. What, what does each one of these points represent? Is it like he checked his phone? This means that at that point, he made a connection to the internet, right. some connection to the internet. And it could be for a brief second, or it could be for a download of a file. But uh, we have also the duration of each connection. But in this particular case, it will complicate the data. I will show you what we can do with the, with the duration on the next slide. Is this different than when you, when you have your Wi-Fi on, you can be tracked? Is this different than that? Absolutely. Uh -huh. This is different. The good thing about Russian GRU spies is that they don't trust Wi-Fi. Yeah. They think that if they connect to the Wi-Fi, we will be able to track them. And they use the phone, which is much more secure. <laughs> but clearly not the case, but they thought so. So they only connect via 3G and 4G. Um, but in this case, it's, the, it's called a single point of failure. Whereas of, with Wi-Fi, some of their presence can be identified because somebody may hack or may hack have access to a hotel Wi-Fi. In this case, all you have to do is just get access to their phone records, billing records, and you have all of their data. So we see that, um, and I, I, I color coded this map. So basically, it starts with uh, greenish in the morning and it goes to red at night just to be able to check uh, when he's where. And we see that he ends up in a, in a place in, near the French border. And interestingly, we see that at that point he calls a number. He calls the French number several times. And, uh, and then he starts moving back into downtown Geneva after staying at that place for about an hour and calling that number several times. He starts driving back to Geneva. Um, and then he comes back here a couple of hours later. What happened 
We took that number, the recall, the French number. We did exactly what we discussed now. I put it in all of the possible messengers, and I found on Facebook that phone number was connected to a hotel. And apparently, it's a hotel apartment, and apparently he arrived after the check-in time, and he couldn't get into his own hotel. So he started calling the hotel number too. And then we knew where he stayed. So that's, that's a little blunder that he did that allowed us to know the hotel where he stayed. Um, okay, so the rest you can read tomorrow because it's really interesting and we found out what he was actually doing in Switzerland. This was one of four trips he took to Switzerland in the course of four months. And the other two guys showed up as well. So this is just a teaser. But let's see what else you can get with such data. Um, I put, and I'll tell you how to do this because it's really useful. Are you familiar, how many of you are familiar with uh, fusion tables? Okay, so about 10%, so then I'll, I'll explain it briefly. Fusion Tables is a Google free app uh, online, which unfortunately they will discontinue in about uh, six months. But there are enough alternatives offered by Google that you can do exactly what I'll show you now on uh, Fusion Tables. Fusion Tables is just a, a consumer version of a lot of the APIs they, they provide. Um, so in Fusion Tables, one of the most useful thing you can do is insert uh, a non-geolocated address-based list and then turn it into a geolocated address list. So imagine you have only a number of times and addresses where a person has been. In this case, that's what we had from the, uh, from the uh, mobile tracking data. We had uh, the, for, for his presence in Russia in particular, we had the time of his connection or a phone call and the address of the cell tower. That's what we had. So we put this in two columns in an Excel sheet, the time of the connection and the address of the cell tower. We didn't have geo-coordinates, just the address. I imported this into, uh, just as an Excel file, I imported it here. We see here on the left is the date, and this is important. I split it into several columns. I split the time into a date and a time, because that would allow us to filter later the maps more precisely. So, Excel. Simple Excel sheet, the date, the time, the duration of the connection, and this used to be addresses. This geo column was only addresses. What I did, however, is I went into edit when it was addresses. I, I went to change columns, and this is the first step you need to do. You go into the column that contains the actual address, and you change it from, it used to be it used to be a text field, which is a default field, and I changed it to location. So that's the first step. When you change it to location, you, you save it, and then the next thing you do is you go to File, and you press on Geocode, and it starts converting the addresses into geolocation data. It will take a while, especially with a file that contains nearly 20,000 rows, it will take half an hour, but after that, it will be ready to map. Yes, please. Is it in Google Sheets? It's in, uh, it's in Google Sheets, but just write Fusion Tables Google and it will take you immediately yeah, to it. Not Excel, but Google Sheets. Yeah, Google Sheets, absolutely, yeah. But you can do it from Excel or from Google Sheets. It, yeah. it doesn't matter how you do it. You can import also a simple CSV file, uh, which is just a text file separated with commas, yeah? So it, it accepts everything. So first, as I said, you change from text to location, then you do geocode, and that's all you need to do. Then. Map will not show up automatically. You have to go into uh, create. Uh, there's a plus here. So basically, you press the plus before that map did not exist. And you add, you press on add map. OK, so that's what I've done already. We don't have to do it again. And we don't have to do the geolocation because it's already done. Now, let's go to map. But before we go to map, I want to tell you the significance of this data. I took only the Russian data of this person over three years. So only his Russian movements for three years about 20,000 internet connections over three years. And I thought, I had the hypothesis that if I do that, I'm going to find out where he works. And I'm going to find out where he lives. And considering that he's a GRU officer of a very high level and that he has some multifunctional skill set because he showed up in one case in a poisoning context and another case in a hacking context, I thought, well, maybe it will give us more than one wor workplace. Maybe it will give us a list of GRU offices in Moscow. 
And that's exactly what we got. So, um, here is a beautiful map of his movements in the course of three years. This is just the default map. It just shows you the towers to which he connected without showing you how many times he connected to these towers. So it shows you the route that he travels. But once you have that, you can start fine tuning it and you can just go to filter and you can say, I wanna only take the month before he traveled to Geneva. I wanna see where he went before he traveled to Geneva. And then you will see a completely different pattern. So you will see that he goes to only one location and his, and his home. Now, um, what is the significance of this? To make it easier to find the significance, uh, well, one thing that I forgot to mention, one thing that of course I immediately did is I made a filter by time because I wanna see where he is during the day and then where he goes at night. So basically here you can put uh, different, different times and you will see a completely different map, uh, but uh, I will share this map with you so you can do it on your own. Um, what is more interesting is this capability called, called heat map, where is that? Uh, yes, heat map is at the bottom, sorry. So you go to heat map and this essentially takes into account the number of times that he connected to a different location. So it basically gives you his pattern, his pattern of presence in Moscow. And this is extremely useful because these dots are essentially the headquarters, the different units of the GRU in Moscow. Some of them were known, but others were not. Others like this one in, uh, in uh, Schodnia was not known. This is the office where they train international spies, apparently, and uh, nobody knew about that, yes? Um, well, there was one reference on a forum in Russia, but the mainstream media never heard about that place, so uh, thanks to this heat map, we now know. Uh, this here, if we zoom up, we will see three locations, and we will see one location is Horoshevskoye 76 b This is the headquarters of the GRU. Another location is the uh, Spy Academy, where he is a teacher. And the other location is his home, which happens to be, and this is hilarious, on the street called Richard Zorge number. I will spare the number because it's private data. But uh, Richard Zorge is a German double spy, yeah? So <laughs> I think it's very imprudent that, that they chose that location for for him to live at. Um, okay, what else does this show us? It basically shows us his roots and so on and so forth. But you can imagine that this data was, uh, if, when it falls into the hands of a, of, a, of a counterintelligence in any other country, becomes an invaluable tool. And that's why the Kremlin freaked out yesterday when we published, we didn't publish this map, but we published the, the fact that we have this data. And it just means that the whole paradigm of, 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 of intelligence services will be changing because they are now realizing how not immune they are to citizen journalists and, and therefore to anybody else. The question is, has, have the intelligence services taken advantage of these new tools or are they using old methods like human intelligence uh, only and therefore falling behind some of the open source investigators? Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to show you. Uh, obviously, this only works when you have a jackpot, such as access to a uh, uh, phone records, but this is more common than you can imagine. I'll give you another example. Um, several years ago, there was a leak in the Russian, on a Russian website called uh, Anonymous International. Uh, the leak was of the company email of Concord Holding. Concord Holding is the St. Petersburg-based company owned by uh, Mr. Evgeny Prigozhin. Do you know who he is? Who, how many have heard the name? Hot Yeah. Evgeny Prigozhin is the guy who, he's known for two uh, reasons. One is that he launched a troll factory in St. Petersburg and he owns it and operates it. And the other one is that he launched the Wagner 
uh, military, uh, well, the, the private army, the private military company Wagner. Um, the, his email archive was, of his secretary, essentially, was put online back in 2014. And a lot of Russian media wrote about it, and they disclosed how he was uh, manipulating news in Russia and attacking opposition leaders and so on and so forth. But I decided to revisit that archive a couple of months ago, um, especially when I started working with geolocation of, uh, of, fo of phone data. And I found that as an attachment to, uh, to, to many of the service emails that the secretary was receiving from the mobile company, there was a long billing list of all of the numbers that were attached to this Concord holding. And I thought, okay, maybe one of these numbers belongs to Mr. Prigozhin. Uh, but there were hundreds of numbers there, so what I did is I wrote a script that went through, uh, through these phone sharing apps that I spoke about earlier, and it checked all the numbers. And it found that one of them belonged to a Yevgeny Viktorovich Prigozhin, which, which is our guy. So I already knew his number. And then I took only the billing records for that number. Now, in a consumer billing report that you as a customer of a mobile operator receive, it doesn't contain the, the, the cell tower data. Um, you have to ask for that specifically. But it had all the numbers that he had called. And the place of his mobile operator. In Russia, if you move from Moscow to St. Petersburg, you connect to a different operator, so you had the name of the operator. So we knew when he was in Moscow, we knew when he was in, uh, in St. Petersburg, we knew when he was in Sochi. But that was not so interesting. What was more interesting is whom he was calling. We're talking about tens of thousands of numbers, and uh, they're just numbers, yeah? So I wrote another script, which went through all of them, and checked them in uh, Get Contact, the most popular Russian app. And I left it running for a whole night. And what this script I wrote did is it ranked it by number of phone calls to a particular uh, phone number. And in the morning I looked, and number one on the list of phone calls over the four, year, four month period that it took was Mr. Peskov, the assistant or the uh, spokesperson for the Russian president. Now, why would Evgeny Prigozhin be calling the presidential spokesperson and uh, uh, advisor so often? I mean, this is just a guy whose main business is catering. Yes, he, he does caters for, Russian, for the Russian government, but a caterer manager would not be calling the, the guy next to the president all the time. Number two on his most called list was uh, a personal uh, 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 one of the, the chief of security uh, to Mr. Putin, and that could be possibly explained with his role as a caterer to the Kremlin, maybe it was a security arrangement. But the number three person he called most was somebody from the Ministry of Defense in counterintelligence, and this made no sense. This could not be connected legitimately to his main, to his main work. So it gave us evidence, along with the other people that he, he kept calling, it gave us evidence that he is somehow involved with the Kremlin in most likely in, in, in the spreading of fake news, most likely with the Wagner operation, something that everybody suspects, but now we had objective proof of that. But the reason I give you this example is because a lot of such data is available out there, but it's, it, it's ignored because it looks technical, it looks like uh, numbers. Get a number, trace it down, you'll find much more than you expect, and you'll be ahead of a lot of your colleagues. So that would be my advice. Yes, please. When you, when you say that it's available there, like where, where are you coming across this? Uh, well, yeah. what, what I'm saying is go through leaked data and look for, for basically ignored attachments. Because so they're not... Like torrent, like torrented would be like an example. Well, in this particular case, um, you can go to the WordPress site of this hacking group, which is still there, and you can then search torrents for the name of the, of the files that they provided teasers on the, on the website. Uh, the website is called uh, Shaltai Boltai, Shaltai.org, I think is the name, S-H-A-L-T-A-I.org, or Y.org. But, but, but this was more of a general tip, that basically don't look at the contact, content of the emails, look at the attachments and you'll get a lot of more data through phone numbers. Because we're getting close to the one hour time limit, I suggest we just open it to questions. I had a couple of other examples, but, uh, but you can read most of these on the Bellingcat website. So questions, please. <laughs> 